Red Belly. That's a clunker, sorry. And that's a clicker. Um, Good afternoon. My name is Matthew Cowell. Thanks, Rachel, for having me out. i have uh, from Colorado. When people are there and their mouths are open, they're walking around, we call them gapers because the mountains are so pretty. And I've been like that here with the apples and the trees in September. It's a beautiful place you live. Um, thanks, uh, Vac Dern, for having me. Um, I'm an emergency preparedness consultant for performing arts readiness. I'm in Denver. The uh, Office of uh, Arts and Venues um, hosts me there for performing arts readiness. There's a um, city owns Red Rocks and Coliseum, and the money from that pays for our cultural programming. And then um, I uh, learned about uh, um, the performing arts readiness grant, and I have a uh, one year, 18-month uh, uh, term in Denver, and then hopefully there's a three-year grant to do this Art of Mass Gatherings concept that I'm gonna tell you about today that um, I got inspired about along my journey as being a, an event producer. Um, I'm a musician, and I'm glad to have a role in recovery and healing, uh, resilience and innovation through the arts, like Sara Lee uh, spoke about. Uh, I learned about American history and social justice through the songs of Woody Guthrie and Elizabeth Cotton, Bob Dylan, that our dad would sing us as bedtime stories. And I'll share some songs like that tonight. A little about my journey. Um, has anybody heard of New Belgium Brewery or Fat Tire Beer out west? Yeah. The brewery was employee owned and uh, born on a bicycle and had this concept that we could take uh, the show on the road and mostly put bikes in the picture and then we could add the fat tire beer and stuff like that and it took off. We'd have uh, 25,000 people per city. That's me in the hat there. That guy just traded his car for a bicycle in front of 25,000 people. I hired a band. They came and sang, this little bike of mine, I'm gonna take a ride. Those guys in the gold vest back there singing and then they would go through a tunnel of love where the audience would make a a tunnel and they'd be welcome to their car-free lifestyle. We came up with that idea on a bike ride on the Willamette River, River my uh, event producer partner and I, and we thought about the Guns for Cash program. We thought, well, what if we did a car for bike trade? 110 people traded their car around the country. Um, over the 10 years I was there, we raised $5 million by throwing free bike parties in the park. We'd have hundreds of volunteers per event, and I, uh, I learned a little bit of something about event producing. So we had cool art, weird bicycles. This is the beautiful dream that would come true in cities around the country as thousands of people rode their bicycles and something kind of like a critical mass but a lot friendlier. Uh, we um, got the uh, Golden Halo Award for content, or sorry, cause marketing, sort of an idea of saying let's put this cause first and then see what happens for the event rather than the brand first. Um, so we owned our own stages, power systems. We're the largest solar powered system. 10 years ago, we started three, fa three stream recycling around the country in a network. And um, this is our, our, you can see the uh, silk screening. We, we call that the born again boutique. Uh, we would collect thrift store articles that were cool around the country and have hundreds of things people could silk screen things onto rather than buying new shirts, it was kind of cool. Um, so, yeah, I learned about brands are sort of like can be a container for people's identity project, which I think is interesting and sometimes weird, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, lots of amazing artists like Maya and, and this uh, local community of circus folks. I, I know a lot of them. I had a 
probably one of the biggest touring variety shows in the country for a time. Um, so, um, towards the end of 2016, I was pushing for even more bicycle-fronted content at all of our events just at the same time as craft brewing was getting pretty soft for the big companies like New Belgium and Sierra Nevada as lots of new companies came up. And uh, our woman, uh, we were a woman-led company, employee-owned, but Kim Jordan left. And sort of in that vacuum, um, the marketing folks who came were like, uh, he was from Guinness, and he said, at Guinness, we had a harp on the side of the label. doesn't mean we need to talk about it. So my bicycle community project festival ran out of road. Um, so in 2016, the festival changed. The company stumbled as it changed leadership and uh, hired a big uh, agency out of LA to uh, do 30 shows instead of 15 and send it in containers around the country. And you see the plasticky stage. What used to be handmade turned into this fat tire vinyl vomit. And um, my money that I'd spend on great performers all went to these millennial-friendly bands that just didn't really work out. And this was the audience that they had in some of their cities. It was just sad. And my heart was kind of broken. And I couldn't hang. And I went to Standing Rock with my wife. And I learned a lot and what it looks like to have a women and elders and youth in leadership and uh, how delicate a community can be when it's facing floods and other hazards. Thought about what my role could be. Um, we spent a week there in the cold, uh, went out thinking I'd cook and do whatever, um, but really started to see that the things I'd learned as an event producer, I produced 120 events around the country, mostly around 10,000 people, and we owned all our own power and waste systems, and I didn't really know what I was gonna do with that, because I was like, I don't like this perpetuation of uh, fame worship that most festivals are. It seems like we end up electing people who are famous for being famous. What's, where's this all leading? You know, I didn't really wanna go there anymore. Um, that little amplifier, though, was a little bit of a clue for me. That little amp I'm holding on my shoulder, we would use instead of megaphones at some of these demonstrations, and it changed the entire tenor of everything. It made things um, more connected, and it didn't feel like, we're here pro protesting. It felt like we're here talking. And so that's sort of where Majestic Collaborations got its start. Um, and I helped figure out these temporary electrical systems while we were there. I realized that um, I knew a lot more about refugee camps and power damaged cities than I might have thought. There we are fixing some stuff that people, uh, we had giant generators that were not connected. I'll, I'll, I'm doing something tomorrow if you want to come learn more about the details. So. Um, anybody here like to cook? I know Rachel does. I got this great dinner last night. There's this new book called Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. Um, she's an amazing uh, uh, chef, and she has this idea about balancing flavors as being the kind of way that delicious food gets made. And um, I love these uh, sort of, um, have you read it? No. Okay, I get it. This is really about the journey, not the destination. And then you kind of practice. She says, if you want to do heat, uh, what do you want to practice? All right, layering, here's these flavors. Try this stuff. Um, this made a lot of sense to me. And so what I've developed as we started this company is this kind of four main flavors of making a successful event. They're safety, sustainability, community relationships, and accessibility. So you can throw a festival that might have two of those, three of those things going on really well, but it may not have accessibility figured out, may not have uh, very good community relations, but if you want to kind of get some excellence going, then these are the pillars for a successful event. So I took this idea on a trip to DC. I met uh, Jack Staluka and Michael Orlov at the National Endowment for the Arts, and I said, I think event producers could be really instrumental in emergency preparedness. We, we've, we make tempor uh, you know, temporary cities all the time. And they said, this is a great idea. Why don't you poke around? And I, I took a course on uh, community resilience with performing arts readiness that Jan works with. And afterwards, I talked to Tom and told him the idea, and I got, um, a home. So the Arts and Venues is hosting me there. I have a grant from uh, Performing Arts Readiness to work on this, and they've allowed me to kind of specialize a bit more in this art of mass gatherings idea. So 
As an experiential learner, I was a teacher. I really think adults learn best from doing stuff, and so PowerPoints are fun and all, but really doing it in person is, uh, is what we want to uh, do to share the skills that event producers have. So this Art of Mass Gatherings, um, let me see how much, how much I have, this is the first time I've given the presentation. So, all right, and I want questions at the end. So here, I'll go ahead and give you the whole spiel. Back up a little for me, Seth. Um, at Majestic Collaborations, we believe in the immense power of the gathering, the communal coming together of large groups of people to share, celebrate, debate, rally, sing, dance, to thrive. Um, because to us, the beauty and power of a mass gathering is to bring together communities around mutual passions in a successful, safe, and sustainable way. It's a critical part of the human experience. So, um, we help organizations that produce events from civic and community organizations to government, private event producers and corporations to understand the underlying dynamics of events and discover ways to integrate core aspects of successful mass gatherings into their planning and operations. Here's where it gets interesting. To a large extent, a lot of these skills already exist in your community, but you may not have met each other. So what we're doing is taking these temporary cities, and we took an excellent one in Denver. We took the Pride Fest. It was a it is a 500,000 person event. They have the best safety plan of any event in Colorado. They're generous enough to make it available for other people to read. And um, we went and studied their waste, water, power, crowd control measures, and we brought event producers and city planners and Office of Emergency Management, and the fire chief was there for Denver, and the uh, head of paramedics was there, the um, environmental health was there, and we said, this is the place to examine, because usually a city, all of the power and water systems are under the streets or in the walls, but if we look at this festival, we can see how the generators, water, and waste systems work. So this is the place, the nerds out there, tactical urbanism, this is a place you can try new ideas for transportation, this is a place you can try stuff, because we have a city for three days in a park somewhere. So we chose Pride Fest, and they hosted it, and um, this was our first group. Um, we were all wearing those cool vests, and we went around Pride Fest. And it was timely. Our Office of Emergency Management and our Denver um, Office of Special Events are instituting 2020. All public events have to have an emergency medical plan submitted before they get the permit. And that was kind of fresh. You'd think in a city as big as Denver, they would have already had that stuff. But this 2020 is when they come online. So they were excited for this art of mass gatherings, because they're like, this is how we can share the information of the best. The 500,000 festival can share with the 50,000 festival. And cities like Chicago have 200 festivals per summer. So how do those people kind of all get a chance to learn? That's what we're looking at. And skipping ahead a little bit, I will tell you that my larger idea for this comes from visiting Lafayette, Louisiana, where they took in 50,000 refugees from Katrina the first couple of months. They were buying a lot of guns and a lot of ammo, and they were expecting that all of these people from New Orleans were gonna wreck their town. They wouldn't tell you that now. They would tell you now that they were proud to take them. 15,000 people stayed in Lafayette, and it's transformed that, that town, and it wasn't the violence they expected, and things ended up going well. And they practiced something that I'm calling radical hospitality, right? And Einstein's theory of relativity was, you spend an hour with a pretty girl and it feels like a minute. You spend a minute sitting on a hot stove, it feels like an hour. So our towns have to kind of go through this experience, this experiment of swelling and taking in people because the Dust Bowl was just our first example of human-caused climate change migration. And we'll get back to that in a minute, but I really think that these festivals can prepare us for our best days and celebration in the park and it'll also serve as a chance for us to practice all those pieces we're gonna to need to use um, to some extent, hopefully not a big extent. Hopefully music and art will help fortify our science and share good ideas, and we won't have terrible things to deal with, but this is the first Art of Mass Gatherings. I've got the notebook in the back. You can take a look at what it was. These are all the things we taught about. You can't see it, it's too pixelated. Um, if we get the grant, we'll be able to come back to a few areas in the next three years. Um, I really think Vermont seems like an opportune place to kind of explore the urban and rural, and you can kind of thread the needle here. I think it's wonderful, Rachel, and the work that she's doing with 
historic mapping and, and all of you folks, I think it, it seems like a pretty good fit. Um, and there's money for it, so I'm not here asking. All right, so four things. What are they again? Safety, sustainability, community relations, accessibility. Start with safety. Now, this will be kind of fun watching the middle here. So emergency plans, uh, that includes stuff like uh, fire, medical emergencies, crowd control, ingress, egress, contingency uh, venues, wastewater, food, active threats. State of repair, that's a kind of neat one. My wife's a civil engineer, and this is sort of the thought of what happens over time. So yes, you made great plans once, but are the fire extinguishers still charged? Are the alarms tested? Did mice eat your food? These sort of things can change. We were ready before. Is it still ready? And then what's your backup plan for maintaining safety in extreme weather, power loss, stuff like that? So there's a lot to remember, right? That sounds crazy. That's what the Art of Mass Gatherings is for. We spend time in an actual well-run event to help get this information, you know, titrated into adults who learn by doing. Um, so we have symposiums, Art of Mass Gathering Symposium, followed up by seminars um, in topic areas. We're doing one on event power in a few weeks in Denver. Um, and we're do, we've done one on harm reduction. Um, there's, we are kind of guided by the local um, requests. Here's some of the stuff I've gone through. A stage contractor, I had to show 2,000 hours of experience to get a license to erect stages. And it was an EMT, and we do these FEMA courses and crowd management stuff a lot of you have done. And um, I would encourage you to um, understand what the incident command system is. I guess another thing I would say is that FEMA is not going to be there for a lot of emergencies. We'll have to take care of each other. And if we do have a highly federal presence in our communities, it might not feel like we want it to. You know, it might feel more militarized and those sort of things. So if we're ready, then, uh-oh, uh storm alert or something's happening. That's a pager. I haven't seen one of those in years. You guys remember the codes, like, for hello and... Millennials are like, don't know what I'm talking about. VHS, Betamax. <laughs> what? So here's kind of a fun picture. That's one of my festivals. On the left, that person's having a ball. The crowd's all really encouraging it. Here's what it looks like. And then on the right, there's, there's what I'm seeing and thinking, where's the electric cords? Where's the, you know? Um, so here's one of our Art of Mass gatherings. That's, us talking about the stage of Pride Fest and how the ballasting works. And even if you aren't the person who's responsible for setting up the stage as the event producer, you have to understand whether they're set up correctly, if people are taking shortcuts, that sort of stuff. So that's just a picture from our Art of Mass Gathering Symposium in Denver. There's Tom Clarison, our buddy. There's uh, somebody from Mojo Barrier talking about crowd control techniques. Um, the woman there was our keynote. Um, from San Francisco, Elliot, who produces Bottle Rock and Hardly Strictly Bluegrass, and she's talking, she talked at her keynote about finding meaning as an event producer and kind of understanding um, how valuable it is. Um, this is a workshop on harm reduction. Um, how am I doing for time? Dude, it's going fast. We have time for songs. Here, we have one coming up in just a minute. Um, there's our chief of paramedics and head of and one of our, uh, they were talking about the new medical plans that all Denver event producers need to do. Um, there's a class on power uh, workshop, safe, safe temporary power. And again, to make the point, those generators and distribution that we're setting up for these giant three-day festivals are the same things you'd use in a power damaged city post disaster. So seeing this stuff and touching it is a good idea before it gets critical. All right, so this will get a little bit interesting. I wrote a, my first for a musical a few months ago, and uh, I, um, this will be fun for um, some of the conversations around cultural placekeeping and using archives as a muse for content. I was approached by this theater to help write for this Fire in the Streets play. It's commemorating the 50th anniversary of the um, West High School walkouts. West High School in Denver had a, a Latino students who were being um, told they couldn't speak Spanish and that they were gonna be stupid for eating beans and treated like really rough. And they walked out of the high school 
and Denver Police Department had purchased riot gear recently that they wanted to try out. And so um, this play um, went for a couple months in March, and it was uh, children were the, or high schoolers were the actors, and there was a band and singing, and I wrote a triptych of songs. Um, one of them was about safety and kind of feeling like you should as a kid at school, and the, another one was about um, West Side Pride, and the third one was about police brutality. And there are some cheery songs, but the first one you're gonna get is about the police in that moment. Clunk, clunk. DPD have been waiting all year to try out their new riot gear. When you're a hammer, don't the whole world look just like a nail? And the hammer came down, jack boots on the ground. Safe for justice, met abuse of power through the scope of a cop's rifle in the school tower. The children look like ants in the schoolyard down below. The cops' eyes were blazed as the riot was waged. And um, you can come to Denver. It's happening again in November, and you can hear the, the, the less depressing songs. Um, isn't it neat how music and food and those sort of things cross the conversations that would be so much more difficult to have? I'm glad for it. The art, that's what it's performing arts are for, right? So, a clicker. We did safety. What's next of the four? I love you guys. All right, waste systems. Um, I'm just giving you the overview. Come to one of these and we'll, we'll get deeper. Waste systems are challenging the dominance of single use models for special events, multi stream reuse, and diversion. They can, they can happen. Um, there's a great chance for city planners to look at multimodal transportation opportunities when they have these large events. Let's try out some new idea for our transportation um, infrastructure. Um, and let's practice our resilience, backup plans for maintaining sustainability, um, even during extreme weather and power loss. Sustainability becomes very important during emergency situations. Is that generator running a 25% duty cycle or 100% duty cycle because there's batteries in front of it? That's gonna make a really big difference. That's how much fuel you have on an island. Sustainability isn't just about, you know, feeling, assuaging your white guilt. It's about whether you have enough fuel to keep that hospital running for a while. Sustainability gets very real in those circumstances. Um, by the way, I think, is there anybody here who works with parks in our city, in our cities? Um, there is, there's a good opportunity, I think, for infrastructure when it gets built to include three-phase power and potable water in parks so that the, during the special events, they don't have to rent generators or do bottled water, but if that park needs to turn into temporary housing in an emergency, you have the infrastructure buried under the ground and it's less susceptible for getting blown over. So um, here's a water tree. Seems simple. This can, this, this can reduce thousands of bottles of water just because people can refuel but you gotta have the, the potable water available in your park. Um, that's some of the stuff we already talked about. Um, solar, biodiesel, temporary, uh, 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 you know, uh, making your own art. Here's something we did on stage. I had a song about this. Uh, we divide our waste in two, three streams. We got compost, trash, and recycling. Make some noise if you compost at home. That's for real. Make some noise if you compost at home. Today at the Tour de Fat, we have 21 pounds of recycling, 17 pounds of landfill, 20, 222 pounds of compost. Good job, everybody. You did that. You collected all that stuff. Thanks for all the volunteers from Illinois Recycling 
uh, they're, they're the ones diverting it, or, and we'd give honorarians to the university's environmental health. They would generally bring out 20 volunteers to our special events, and they would run these three stream um, recycling stations. And you could get a 20,000 person festival, we'd cover three stream by giving a thousand dollar honorarium to the university because the kids wanted to come out. They also got a free beer, they'd do an hour, uh, you know, service in a compost sorting. Um, but just ways to leverage community to, to help make that happen. Okay, I'm taking you down the depths a little bit here. We talked about this before, that the Dust Bowl, I grew up listening to these songs from my dad. He was an old Woody Guthrie fan and second generation Quaker peace activist guy. And when it would get time for bed, he'd say, get one more. And we'd ask for the Ballad of Tom Joad because it was like 12 verses long. <laughs> Who knows where that song, what it's based on? Grapes of Wrath. John Steinbeck heard Woody sing it in a coffee shop, and he told Woody, I think I like your song better than my book, because it's shorter and more to the point. What are you doing here? You're doing good. All right, I'll give you a, give you a few verses, not all 12. Tom Joel got out on the Callister pen. There he got his parole. And after five long years, on man killing charge. Tom Joel would come walking down the road. Tom Joel would come walking down the road. Well, he went on down to the neighbor's farm. He found his family. Yeah, and it took preacher case and they loaded in a truck. His mama said, we got to get away, Tom. Mama said, we got to get away. Well, 12 of the Jordans made my and soothing syrups. Grandpa Joe did die. They buried Grandpa Joe off the side of the road. Grandma on the California side. They buried Grandma on the California side. He stood on a mountain, looked off to the west and looked just like a promised land.
What's the third one? It's easy. It's on the board. Community engagement. Oh, we're doing great. True participation comes from the open dialogues that can change the course of your event or plan design. You're not collaborating if you've gone into the conversation with the community and you already know how it's going to go. You have to go in and let it change what your event is going to be. Learn to thrive in that instead of avoid it. Involvement and buy-in is dynamic and requires attention and care. But here's what you get. If you can muster hundreds of volunteers at your event, you have a force magnifier for your programs. That's eyes and ears. Those are all people who can see something, say something. And if you want to make a more sustainable event or have accessibility stuff happen, it's, you can't hire all of that stuff. If you can find the volunteers, then you're in the right thing. Now, here's what you also know. Colorado has had a whole bunch of festivals come and go. I get asked when I'm consulting about new events, like, hey, what, what would work here? Can we do a pro cycle challenge or these sort of things? And I, my advice is just don't leave the room until you've figured out something that's bigger than yourself, that's bigger than just the music, until you figure out something the community truly wants. And then those people who are coming will organically share with each other that this is a cool event. And right now, Facebook got everybody hooked. And now you can hardly reach anybody with advertisements. You can, it's very difficult to pay to reach other folks. But organic share still works. So this is kind of a, this is, this is a good sell to your event producers to say, keep working until this is really resonant with the community because it's hard to find audiences sometimes. Um, and think ahead, what's your backup plan for community in media communications for extreme weather, power loss, stuff like that. So you have your good day plan for community relations and your bad day plan. Um, one of my ones that went well, anybody heard of the Moth Story Project? Um, I had some friends there and we um, put together a, a national call for bicycle stories and we got some great ones and we recorded some at our event. You can hear Malik's, uh, um, one on there about, oh, I, I can't do it justice in a short time, but it's really worth hearing. Um, but um, how did I put this? If, um, if you have a synergistic relationship with local people who will come out, socially motivated, and then if you can find national media that wants your story, then you can reach three million people or more with, with this, is what happened with the moth for this bicycle um, concept. and. Um, that's one time I did it. This one's sort of funny. There's a, a DC show. We had a thematic stuff where uh, Maya, you guys might know some of these performers. Those are the handsome little devils. So during the car for bike trade, we had um, these aliens come down to Earth, and they were set on this mission by their overlord to like take us out and because we weren't respecting the planet. And they said, would anybody here trade their car for a bicycle? And then the person who had been selected is like, I'll trade my car. And they're like, all right, we'll let the planet live another 10 years, but we're gonna need to send a picture back to our boss that we wiped you all out, so everybody play dead. So, so everybody laid down, like, all right, and carpet bike trade. Eighth year, you gotta do stuff to keep it interesting, right? This was another thing we did for one another year. The bike is right. What would... well, this one was fun. Um, this is going very far off of a joke. What are the mistaken lyrics? My sister used to sing one was um, the Rolling Stones. She'd be like, I never leave your pizza burning. <laughs> and then <laughs> what's the common one for um, Elton John's Hold Me Closer, Your Tiny, tiny Dancer? 
Hold Me Closer, Tony Danza. So we drew up this thing on a cocktail napkin, and we said, let's, we want to give the audience a hug in a box. What if we built this? And I came through the stage with fog and a two-wheel crazy dirt bike lady. Put down your kickstand. He's an actor. And hold me closer, Tony Danza. And people are just looking at each other like, is this happening? Oh my God. And uh, it was, I don't know, it was a hug in a box. That's what that community engagement. Here's one of our power projects. I work at McNichols Civic Center Park downtown. There's 20 food trucks with all of these generators running every day right in our park by the Capitol. And um, I talked to Miss Pamela's crew. I said, you guys want to learn how to run temporary power? I'll teach you. So we went, there's three-phase power into the Greek theater, and we ran distro to all these trucks. And it was silent. We did three-phase power and three-stream recycling, and the park was transformed. And now those guys know how to do it. We got the power. Um, this portion's about native land recognition. Um, has anybody heard of the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture? It's not a real department, it's a nonprofit, and they have a um, handbook for incorporating uh, native land acknowledgments before your events. Um, it's worth looking into. I will say one of the things I feel good about sharing is that you should always invite a culture bearer or an elder to do it, rather than just adding obligatory language to your event before it starts. Invite them to be part of this, and it's an ongoing reconciliation and community building that's not just saying words. Um, I grew some tobacco and shared with these guys and found an honorarium. Um, some friends um, knew them. They, they host a, a run from um, uh, Sand Creek Massacre every year um, east of Denver, and we're good friends now. And uh, they surprised me. They talked. We did. Remember where we did the first Art of Mass gatherings in Denver? It was at Pride Fest. They came out to speak and had a lot of wonderful things to share about. Two Spirit, the, the history of 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 um, their, their, of of, ex, uh, of a multiplicity of sexualities and being less um, binary about these sort of things. It was really well. It was wonderful to have them do it. All right, I have another song. Um, this is from a bicycle celebration days about uh, um, the celebration of the bicycle. Just a freaky and I ride my bike since the olden days when I rode my trike and I used to think I was all alone. But now I found you, I know I'm not alone. Hit it! <laughs> we don't worry, hardly sweating on busy days, we never scurry. Now, remember, this isn't best done with a PowerPoint presentation. This stuff is best done in a real environment where it's going on really well. Or even if it's not, you can at least look at it and say, all right, those cable ramps are the old style, and they're this tall. And if you're in a wheelchair, you can't get over it. You know, where are they going to find the new type of cable ramps where people can get over it and um, those sort of things. So I'll just throw out some of the highlights of things I've um, figured out. And, they say an expert is somebody who's done everything wrong once and remembered what they did, you know. Right, Jan? Right. <laughs> Here's one. This is a visual map. Good part is if you don't speak English, you know how to find your way around the place. Um, bad thing is we put it low and people could come and mess with it. So note to self, put it higher next time. Um, if you can use words, maybe funny is good. Here's some of our tricks with 
compost office, beer tokens of affection, wristband camp. Um, diversity of leadership and artists. Um, you have to affirmatively seek out people for your team. And it's not enough to just say you're non-discriminatory in your hiring practices. If you're a talent buyer, if you're trying to put together a team, you have to seek out youth, people of color, older folks. This is not something that will just come to you. You'll just be fishing in your own pond. So it's upon all of us who have budgets to hire people to go and, and find a diverse pool of, of uh, potential candidates. Uh, meet Stephen, uh, a sign language interpreter. Um, he taught me about how great it is for interpreters to meet with the artist beforehand and ask questions like, when you said, uh, forget some of the funny things, when you said this, did you mean that or this? And at any rate, it's really great for the uh, sign language interpreters to have time with their folks. Um, sensory friendly concerts um, are, are are starting to blossom, that's a wonderful thing. Eagle Stadium has a sensory friendly room for people who are suffering memory problems or have on the spectrum and able to, to enjoy um, the game in a way that isn't over stimulating and their family can kind of go. There's um, giant balls in front of subwoofers can feel great for people who can't hear to be able to feel the beat come through their body. All right. So this song is about what we can do together. I already told you about Lafayette, Louisiana. I was going to talk about that a little more. Remember relativity, what a city can feel like if they want to be radically hospitable. That's something I think I would love to see these Art of Mass gatherings do, is not just to make our events safer, but really make our cities more prepared for change. Um, and I'll be ready for some questions after this song. This is one that um, I wrote, and you can um, I brought some records I'll give away. Whoever asked the best question. <laughs> Fall into you with no reservation. And I want to give it to you. Do you need explanation? John, do you buy this morbid curiosity? Because you got this mask of communication with utter honesty. And I can't hold too tight, gotta let it go. Seems by now you gotta know we've been patient for so long. And the love I got for you is fairly natural. And it's like the northern lights or a Like the northern lights, or a 
tornado. So I wrote that a long time ago. I didn't think it'd be very applicable. <laughs> but I don't know, tornadoes and northern lights and stuff. So I want to uh, thank my wife, Molly, who are live streaming this. And so love you, and thanks for watching the kids while I'm gone. And I think now would be a good time for Tunnel of Love from Rachel and all the people who put this on. How do you feel about getting on your feet, going down that aisle over there? And Rachel, we're taking a little walk through there for all the good work she's done. She deserves it, right? <laughs> on your feet, on your feet, here's the Tunnel of Love. She's gonna walk right down there. She's gonna feel your love. This is a really mundane question. You showed a slide of people standing on a sidewalk. It had to do with crowd control, kind of, and there was a stainless that steel bracket. Yes. What was that? Cool, cool. That stuff's called Mojo Barrier, and it's sort of like Kleenex, you know, or it gets named after the company, but then there's other people that make it. But basically, because you're standing on that L plate, it doesn't tip, and so they can put it in front of giant crowds, and it, and it creates a barrier between the audience and the, the front of the stage, and then they'll usually have a pit there where security can kind of move, take people over the top. There's, you know, so Mojo. Come on, there's crazier ones than that. <laughs> You're, okay. uh, thank you for, this is the first time I've shared this. I really appreciate an opportunity to, to talk about it and um, there's the Art of Mass Gatherings book is out front, my card, um, Performing Arts Readiness. Thanks for having me out and everybody else. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Actually, since we have just a moment, I'd like to invite Karen Dillon from the Chandler just to come down here for one minute and say hello. We want to thank you for all the... Um, your staff, Seth, and for the use of the space. Really, thank you. Hi, I just want to say a quick hello. I'm Karen Dillon. I'm the new executive director here at the Chandler. Um, thanks for coming. We love having the Vermont Arts Council here. And uh, thanks to Seth Stoddard, my staff, who's taking good care of you today, I think. Before you go today, please check out our programming. Uh, we have some exciting new programming coming up, including the Fretless this Friday. We have Darling Side next week on the 20th. Uh, we're also doing lots of art classes, uh, workshops. We have a new writer's literary series that's kicking off on the 26th of this month. Uh, what else do we have going on? We have a new film society that's starting this Sunday. Uh, we're doing Singing in the Rain on this beautiful screen. How often do you get to see a movie that big? So please check out what we're doing at the Chandler. I think it's exciting, and thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. This is just a great spot for this. We really appreciate being here.